welcome to another episode of Myths vs. Facts. This week marks the halfway point for this series, and I'd like to take this time to respond to some of the many questions or comments that have been made up to this point. The first comment discussed this individual's definition of a conspiracy as being any plan that affects me that I am explicitly kept in ignorance of. My definition of a conspiracy is where two or more persons unite in secret for an evil purpose. People understand criminal conspiracies such as the mafia, but fewer understand the diabolical political conspiracies. For decent people, it's hard to get one's head around it. Diabolical political conspiracies have existed throughout human history. They are mentioned several times in scripture, for instance. And the plot against Christ was a conspiracy, wasn't it? Couple this with the satanic aspect of some men, and it becomes even more difficult to understand and accept as fact. Conspiracy is organized. The results are manifested in the same agenda, being implemented at the same time across a broad spectrum of society. This denotes organization. As Franklin Delano Roosevelt was purported to have said, nothing happens in politics that wasn't planned. If it happens, you can be sure it was planned that way. In other words, if there is a plan, there are planners. Another person asks, will someone tell me who finances the Illuminati? First of all, we are not sure that the Illuminati still exists. However, having said that, Something similar must exist since the Illuminist goals are still being implemented. This style of organization does not require much money to operate. Most of the money is spent on their agenda. Now the money comes from the wealthy in their influence, the foundations run by their minions, and the bankers who control vast sums of money. Most of these funds are not used to sustain the conspiracy, but to implement the conspiracy's agenda. Now, over the years, this conspiracy has recruited into its ranks the sons of the rich and powerful. This has supplied the basis for the monies expended by the conspiracy. By all appearances, this has included many of the Rockefellers, Carnegies, Vanderbilt, etc. over the years. Our next comment comes from episode three, where I discuss the Illuminati's overall goals. This viewer stated, you still see people blaming all Jews ex exclusively for this problem today. Ignorance is very hard to overcome. My response to this is, racial and religious prejudice has always run through the leadership ranks of the Illuminati and its offspring. In the case of the Jews, Illuminist agents adopted Jewish code names to hide their identities, and it also served as a means to prejudice people against the Jews amongst those who opposed Illuminist designs. The Illuminati has used the age-old prejudices that have existed in Europe especially to neutralize its opposition by a making it look as though it was a Jewish conspiracy rather than a satanic one. Certain tra tracks have been penned, such as the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, to make it appear to be Jewish in origin. B, at the same time, the hatred generated against the Jews by the conspiracy has fooled and reacted several Jews into doing their dirty work for them. Please note that whenever the conspiracy has taken over a country, the Jews who remain faithful to their religion are some of the first to be eliminated. This is also true of many sects, and Lenin pointed out those who needed to be eliminated, which included many of the same groups thought to be part of the problem of building communism, a prime part of the conspiracy. Let us also make the point that the conspiracy cannot be of any particular race or religion, or it won't work. If it was, the lower ranks of their minions would not work for them. The reason being that ambition is one of the chief traits of the members of the conspiracy. They would realize that they had no chance to rise to the top if the leadership 
that they were, uh, if the leadership was of a race that they were not of, if a different race ran it, they could never rise to the top. So it won't work. If the conspiracy was composed at the top of only one race or religion, they could not unite enough followers to be successful. This is a general answer to the idea that the conspiracy is Jewish. We, as Americanists, must judge people as individuals, not as blocks of race, color, religion, ethnicity, etc. They, the conspiracy actually gets us fighting one another instead of the real source. And that's why a lot of people promote the idea of a Jewish conspiracy. Our next comment is from my introduction to, communi to communism episode. This viewer states, logical fallacy. If the collectivists of the Illuminati want a one world government, they can't be behind anarchy and communism as these are stateless societies. Socialism and other forms of status collectivism under monopoly on, uh, under, with a monopoly on violence, however, is another matter. Remember, they want total control so they can't let any degree of control they have achieved by whatever means go. Well, hard to respond to that, but my response is this. Anarchy is a condition of no government. Communism is sold as a stateless society. It's one of their selling points. Yet it is rather, rather obvious that everywhere and anywhere communism has been established, there is total government, total government control, after they massacre millions to eliminate any opposition. There is not one example of communism being a stateless society. Quite the opposite. They are the total state. Now, there are many fingers on the hand of the conspiracy, including anarchy, communism, fascism, corporatism, etc. These centrally controlled isms are made to appear as if they are opposed to one another, but this is not true at the top. Anarchy is used to create a governmental vacuum for the purpose of another system to rush into that vacuum to replace the previous system. Something will always flow into a vacuum. We suggest, by the way, that you access the short video overview of America to further explain this phenomenon. Also, let me point out that it is rare the anarch le anarchist leaders do not show up to be communists. This happens all the time. Anarchist organizations always appear at socialist and communist-sponsored demonstrations. They cooperate a great deal. Anarchy is an ideal, but a farce, and cannot last long. It is only used to create chaos into which a superior organization flows to take over. Our next question is from the communism episode as well. The viewer, the viewer asks, why does the news media, Hollywood, Democrats, Republicans, and the general population of America smear you all as loony conspiracy theorists and that the John Birch Society is a bunch of right-wing wackos. You appear to be honest, decent, and patriotic to myself. Well, the quick answer is because we present a danger to the deep state. A conspiracy cannot stand the light of day, and we are very involved in exposing them to that light. So, they have tried to eliminate us by the use of a smear campaign, and at the same time, downplay our influence. It hasn't worked. To better understand what is happening in this regard, I recommend my latest book, soon to be released, Inside the Shadows of the Deep State, The Influence of the Council on Foreign Relations. Question six comes from an episode 11, where I discuss conspiracy and what's behind the Democrat club. This viewer says, so if I understand correctly, Washington was actually not supporting Illuminati Jacobinism. Was, is he then satisfied about when he acknowledged these doctrines and principles that had come to America? In any case, thanks for those, these clips. Well, my answer is this. That is correct. He recognized that the early problems that beset his administration were driven by this evil force and had been introduced into America by 1782. Washington was well aware of the Illuminati and its influence. Next is question seven, 
from the Young America segment on the Illuminati's influence on education. This viewer asks, why is the Constitution of the United States the world's only chance? The answer is that our Constitution is the oldest Constitution in use because it works better than any other. It was constructed to limit government and protect God-given rights and our independence as long as it's followed as written. However, it only serves a moral and ethical people. It will not work otherwise nor will it work if the people are ignorant of the principles on which it was founded. Our country has always been an example to the rest of the world. The following viewer asks, so if we had good men back in those days with good intentions, why didn't they blow the whistle early on? Were they afraid of hurting America's reputation? Now the answer to this is that the conspiracy of the type we are ad addressing is hard to believe. But more important, people really did not understand how to organize to expose and stop it. Coupled with a lack of responsibility to get involved if they did. No organization has had ever been formed to do so until the John Birch Society was formed 60 years ago. From one of my later uh, segments on Skull and Bones, this viewer asks, so where does Trump fit in as a Templar? He doesn't support the New World Order. My response to this is that we have no understanding of Trump's motivation other than what he states himself. Trump has a problem in that he is, has a problem if he is totally honest with us because he's still surrounded by the deep state in the government and his own cabinet. Before we close out this Q&A, there was one more comment from the Skull and Bones segment I would like to respond, to respond to. This viewer states, Thank you so much, Art. My question is, is there such a thing as a, as a good illuminist? Justice Kavanaugh is a Yale graduate, just as the Bushes and Clintons, who are part of the Skull and Bones. All public figures must be part of the Illuminati. Does this make Sean Kennedy, for example, a good guy, or it's all a show? Thank you. Well, first of all, Clinton was not part of Skull and Bones, but he was mentored at Georgetown by uh, Carol Quigley, who was part of this coterie. Now, we can't look into the heart of a person. All we can do is notice what they say or what they do not say. We also have to look at their friends since we're known by the company we keep, aren't we? We might ask a few questions about people. First of all, are they honest about the John Birch Society? You can tell an awful lot when they aren't. Secondly, do they use words like McCarthyism, extol the virtues of Martin Luther King or other icons of the left, falsely fed to the people as great men? And third, on the issues, do they simply talk to the main points promoted by the mass media? Or do they expose the hidden dangers the American people need to know? For instance, in the debate over free trade, can you recall one nationally recognized conservative pundit who brought up the issue of sovereignty concerning NAFTA or the new U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement? Often it's what people do not say that gives them away. With that being said, this ends our first Q&A of Myths versus Facts. I encourage you to watch every episode previously as well as those in the future and keep your questions and comments coming. Beginning next week, we will discuss the buildup of the Civil War. We'll see you then.